Linda Sue Parks, A Long Walk to Water. A Long Walk to Water, based on a true story. Chapter 1, Southern Sudan, 2008. Going was easy. Going, the big plastic container held only air. Tall for her 11 years, Mia could switch the handle from one hand to the other, swing the container by her side, or cradle it in both arms. She could even drag it behind her, bumping it against the ground and raising a tiny cloud of dust with each step. There was little weight going. There was only heat, the sun already baking the air, even though it was long before noon. It would take her half the morning if she didn't stop on the way. Heat, time, and thorns. Southern Sudan, 1985. Salva sat cross-legged on the bench. He kept his head turned toward the front, hands folded back perfectly straight. Everything about him was paying attention to the teacher, everything except his eyes and his mind. His eyes kept flicking toward the window, through which he could see the road. The road home, just a little while longer, a few minutes more, and he would be walking on that road. The teacher droned on with the lesson about the Arabic language. Salva spoke the language of his Dinka tribe at home, but in school he learned Arabic, the official language of the Sudanese government far away to the north. Eleven years old on his last birthday, Salva was a good student. He already knew the lesson, which was why he was letting his mind wander down the road ahead of his body. Salva was well aware of how lucky he was to be able to go to school. He could not attend the entire year because during the dry season his family moved away from their village. But during the rainy season, he could walk to the school, which was only half an hour from his home. Salva's father was a successful man. He owned many head of cattle and worked as their village's judge, an honored, respected position. Salva had three brothers and two sisters. As each boy reached the age of about ooh, 10 years, he was sent off to school. Salva's older brothers, Eric and Ring, had gone to school before him. Last year, it had been Salva's turn. His two sisters, Akit and Agnath, did not go to school. Like the other girls in the village, they stayed home and learned from their mother how to keep house. Mm. Most of the time, Salva was glad to be able to go to school, but some days he wished he were still back at home herding cattle. He and his brothers, along with the sons of his father's other wives, would walk with the herds to the water holes where there was good grazing. The responsibilities depended on how old they were. Salva's younger brother, Kual, was taking care of just one cow, like his brothers before him. He would be in charge of more cows every year. Before Salva had begun going to school, he had helped look after the entire herd and his brother, younger brother as well. The boys had to keep an eye on the cows, but the cows did not really need much care. That left plenty of time to play. Salva and the other boys made cows out of clay. The more cows you made, the richer you were. But they had to be fine, healthy animals. It took time to make a lump of clay look like a good cow. The boys would challenge each other to see who could make the most and best cows. Other times they would practice with their bows and arrows, shooting at small animals or birds. They weren't very good at this yet, but once in a while they got lucky. Those were the best days. When one of them managed to kill a ground squirrel or a rabbit, a guinea hen or a grouse, the boys' aimless play halted and there was suddenly a lot of work to do. Some of them gathered wood to build a fire. Others helped clean and dress the animal. Then they roasted it on the fire. None of this took place quietly. Salva had his own opinion of how the fire should be built and how long the meat needed to cook, and so did each of the others. The fire needs to be bigger. It won't last long enough. We need more wood. No, it's big enough already. Quick, turn it over before it's ruined. The juices dripped and sizzled. A delicious smell filled the air. Finally, they could wait. They couldn't wait one second longer. There was only enough for each boy to have a few bites, but oh, how delicious those bites were. Salva swallowed and turned his eyes back toward the teacher. He wished he hadn't recalled those times because the memories made him hungry. Milk. 
When he got home, he would have a bowl of fresh milk, which would help his belly full until supper time, which would keep his belly full until supper time. He knew just how it would be. His mother would rise from her work grinding meal and walk around to the side of the house that faced the road. She would shade her eyes with one hand searching for him. From far off, he would see her bright orange headscarf and he would raise his arm in greeting. By the time he reached the house, she would have gone inside to get his bowl of milk ready for him. Crack! The noise had come from outside. Was it a gunshot or just a car backfiring? The teacher stopped talking for a moment. Every head in the room turned toward the window. Nothing. Silence. The teacher cleared his throat, which drew the boy's attention to the front of the room again. He continued the lesson from where he had left off, then crack, pop, pop, crack, gunfire. Everyone down, the teacher shouted. Some of the boys moved at once, ducking their heads and hunching over. Others sat frozen, their eyes and mouths wide open. Salva covered his head with his hands and looked from side to side in panic. The teacher edged his way along the wall to the window. He took a quick peek outside. The gunfire had stopped, but now people were shouting and running. Go quickly, all of you, the teacher said, his voice low and urgent, into the bush. Do you hear me? Not home. Don't run home. They will be going into the villages. Stay away from the villages. Run into the bush. He went to the door and looked out again. Go, all of you, now. The war had started two years earlier. Salva did not understand much about it, but he knew that rebels from the southern part of Sudan, where he and his family lived, were fighting against the government, which was based in the north. Most of the people who lived in the north were Muslim, and the government wanted all of Sudan to become a Muslim country, a place where the beliefs of Islam were followed. But the people in the south were of different religions and did not want to be forced to practice Islam. They began fighting for independence from the north. The fighting was scattered all around southern Sudan, and now the war had come to where Salva lived. The boys scrambled to their feet. Some of them were crying. The teacher began hurrying the students out the door. Salva was near the end of the line. He felt his heart beating so hard that its pulse pounded in his throat and ears. He wanted to shout, I need to go home. I must go home. But the words were blocked by the wind thumping in his throat. By the wild thumping in his throat. When he got to the door, he looked out. Everyone was running, men, children, women, carrying babies. The air was full of dust that had been kicked up by all those running feet. Some of the men were shouting and waving guns. Salva saw all this with one glance. Then he was running, too, running as hard as he could into the bush, away from home. Chapter 2, Southern Sudan, 2008 Naya put the container down and sat on the ground. She always tried not to step on the spiky plants that grew along the path, but their thorns littered the ground everywhere. She looked at the bottom of her foot. There it was, a big thorn that had broken off right in the middle of her heel. Naya pushed at the skin around the thorn, then she picked up another thorn and used it to poke and prod at the first one. She pressed her lips together against the pain. Southern Sudan, 1985. Boom! Salva turned and looked. Behind him, a huge black cloud of smoke rose. Flames darted out of its base. Overhead, a jet plane veered away like a sleek, evil bird. In the smoke and dust, he couldn't see the school anymore, the school building anymore. He tripped and almost fell. No more looking back, it slowed him down. Salva lowered his head and ran. He ran until he could not run anymore. Then he walked for hours until the sun was nearly gone from the sky. Other people were walking, too. There were so many of them, but they couldn't all be from the school village. They must have come from the whole area. As Salva walked, he, the same thoughts kept going through his head in rhythm with his steps. Where are we going? Where is my family? When will I see them again? The people stopped walking when it grew too dark to see the path. At first, everyone stood around uncertainly, speaking in tense whispers or silent with fear. Then some of the men gathered and talked for a few moments. One of them called out, Villages, group yourselves by villages. You will find someone you know. Salva wandered around until he heard the words, Loon Eric, the village of Larn Eric here. Ref relief flooded through him. That was his village. He hurried toward the sound of the voice. A dozen or so people stood in a loose group at the side of the road. Salva scanned their faces. There was no one from his family. He recognized a few people, a woman with a baby, two men, a teenage girl, 
but no one he knew well. Still, it was comforting to see them. They spent the night right there on the road, the men taking shifts to keep watch. The next morning, they began walking again. Salva stayed in the midst of the crowd with the other villagers from Lun Eric. In the early afternoon, he saw a large group of soldiers up ahead. Word passed through the crowd. It's the rebels, the rebels, those who were fighting against the government. Salva passed several rebel soldiers waiting by the side of the road. Each of them held a big gun. Their guns were not pointed at the crowd, but even so, the soldiers seemed fierce and watchful. Some of the rebels then joined the back of the line. Now the villagers were surrounded. What are they going to do to us? Where is my family? Late in the day, the villagers arrived at the rebel camp. The soldiers ordered them to separate into two groups, men in one group, women and children, and the elderly in the other. Teenage boys, it seemed, were considered men, for boys who looked to be only a few years older than Salva were joining the men's group. Salva hesitated for a moment. He was only eleven, but he was the son of an important family. He was Salva Mawin Dut Arik, from the village named for his grandfather. His father always told him to act like a man, to follow the example of his older brothers, and, in, re in turn, set a good example for Kual. Salva took a few steps toward the men. Hey. A soldier approached Salva and raised his gun. Salva froze. All he could see was the gun's huge barrel, black and gleaming, as it moved toward his face. The end of the barrel touched his chin. Salva felt his knees turn to water. He closed his eyes. If I die now, I will never see my family again. Somehow, this thought strengthened him enough to keep him from collapsing in terror. He took a deep breath and opened his eyes. The soldier was holding the gun with only one hand. He was not aiming it. He was using it to lift Salva's chin so he could get a better look at his face. Over there, the soldier said. He moved the gun and pointed it toward the group of women and children. You are not a man yet. Don't be in such a hurry. He laughed and clapped Salva on the shoulder. Salva scurried over to the women's side. The next morning, the rebels moved on from the camp. The village men were forced to carry supplies, guns and mortars, shells, radio equipment. Salva watched as one man protested that he did not want to go with the rebels. A soldier hit him in the face with the butt of a gun. The man fell to the ground, bleeding. After that, no one objected. The men shouldered the heavy equipment and left the camp. Everyone else began walking again. They went in the opposite direction from the rebels, for wherever the rebels went, there was sure to be fighting. Salva stayed with the group from Lun Eric. It was smaller now without the men, and except for the infant, Salva was the only child. That evening, they found a barn in which to spend the night. Salva tossed relentlessly in the itchy hay. Where are we going? Where is my family? When will I see them again? It took him a long time to fall asleep. Even before he was fully awake, Salva could feel that something was wrong. He lay very still with his eyes closed, trying to sense what it might be. Finally, he sat up and opened his eyes. No one else was in the barn. Salva stood so quickly that for a moment he felt dizzy. He rushed to the door and looked out. Nobody. Nothing. They had left him. He was alone. Chapter 3 Southern Sudan, 2008 the smudge on the horizon gained color as Niwa drew nearer, changing from hazy gray to olive green. The dirt under her feet turned to mud, then sludge, until at last she was ankle-deep in water. There was always so much life around the pond. Other people, mostly women and girls, who had come to fill their own containers, many kinds of birds, all flap and twitter and caw, herds of cattle that had been brought to the good grazing by the young boys who looked after them. Nia took the hollowed gourd that was tied to the handle of the plastic container. She untied it, scooped up the brown, muddy water, and drank. It took two gourdfuls before she felt a little cooler inside. Nia filled the container all the way to the top. Then she tied the gourd back in place and took the padded cloth donut from her pocket. The donut went on her head first, followed by the heavy container of water, which she would hold in place with one hand. With the water balanced on her head and her foot still sore from the thorn, Na knew that going home would take longer than coming had, but she might reach home by noon if all went well. Southern Sudan, 1985 The tears were hot in Salva's eyes. Where had everyone gone? Why had they left without waking him? He knew the answer, because he was a child, 
who might tire easily and slow them down and complain about being hungry and cause trouble somehow. I would not have been in any trouble. I would not have complained. What will I do now? Salva took a few steps to see what he could see. On the far horizon, the sky was hazy from the smoke of the bombs. About a hundred paces in front of him, he could see a small pond. Between the pond and the barn was a house, and yes, a woman sitting in the sun. Holding his breath, he crept closer until he could see her face clearly. The ritual scar patterns on her forehead were familiar. They were Dinka patterns, which meant that she was from the same tribe as Salva. Salva let out his breath in relief. He was glad that she was not newer. Newer and the Dinka had a long history of trouble. No one, it seemed, was sure where newer land ended and Dinka land began, so each tribe tried to lay claim to the area's richest in water. Over the years, there had been many battles, large and small, between Dinka and Nur. Many people on both sides had been killed. This was not the same as the war that was going on now between the rebels and the government. The Dinka and the Nur had been fighting each other for hundreds of years. The woman looked up and saw him. Salva flinched at her glance. Would she be friendly to a stranger? Would she be angry with him for spending the night in her barn? But at least he was not alone now, and that knowledge was stronger than the uncertainty about the woman might do or say to him. He walked toward her. Good morning, auntie, he said, his voice trembling. She nodded at him. She was old, much older than Salva's mother. He kept quiet, waiting for her to speak. You must be hungry, she said at last. She stood and went into the house. A few moments later, she came back out and gave him two handfuls of raw peanuts. Then she sat down again. Thank you, Auntie. Squatting on his haunches next to her, Salva shelled the nuts and ate them. He chewed every nut into paste before he swallowed, trying to make each one last as long as he could. The woman sat without speaking until he was finished. Then she asked, Where are your people? Salva opened his mouth to speak, but his eyes filled with tears again, and he could not answer. She frowned. Are you an orphan? He shook his head quickly. For a moment, he felt almost angry. He was not an orphan. He had a father and a mother. He had a family. I was at school. I ran away from the fighting. I do not know where my family is. She nodded. A bad thing, this war. What are you going to do? How will you find them? Salva had no answer. He had hoped that the woman might have some answers for him. After all, she was an adult. Instead, she had only questions. Everything was upside down. Salva stayed in the woman's barn again that night. He began to make a plan. Maybe I can stay here until the fighting stops. Then I will go back to my village and find my family. He worked hard so she would not send him away. For three days, he fetched firewood from the bush and water from the pond. But the pond was drying up. Each day it was harder to fill the gourd. During the daytime, Salva could hear the distant booming of artillery from the fighting a few miles away. With every shell that exploded, he would think of his family, hope they were safe, wondering desperately when he would be with them again. On the fourth day, the old woman told him that she was leaving. You have seen that the pond is only a puddle now. Winter is coming, and the dry season, and this fighting. She nodded her head in the direction of the noise. I will go to a different village near water. You cannot stay with me any longer. Selva stared at her as panic rose inside him. Why can't I go with her? The woman spoke again before he could ask aloud. The soldiers will leave me alone, an old woman on her own. It would be more dangerous for me to travel with you. She shook her head in sympathy. I am sorry I cannot help you anymore, she said. Wherever it is you walk, just be sure to walk away from the fighting. Salva stumbled back to the barn. What will I do? Where will I go? The words repeated themselves a thousand times in his head. It was so strange. He had known the old woman for only a few days, but now he could not imagine what he would do once she was gone. He sat inside the barn and stared out, looking at nothing. As the light grew dimmer, the noises of evening began, the buzz of insects, the rustling of dry leaves, and another sound. Voices? Salva turned his head toward the sound. Yes, it was voices. Some people were walking toward the house, a small group, fewer than a dozen. As they approached, Salva took a sharp breath. In the fading light, he could see the faces of those nearest him. Two of the men had patterns of V-shaped scars on their foreheads. Dinka patterns again, the kind that were given to the boys in Salva's village as part of the ritual of becoming a man. These people were Dinka too. Could his family be among them? 
Chapter 4, Southern Sudan, 2008 Mia's mother took the plastic container from her and emptied the water into three large jars. She handed Mia a bowl of boiled sorghum meal and poured a little milk over it. Mia sat outside in the shade of the house and ate. When she was done, she took the bowl back inside. Her mother was nursing the baby, Mia's little brother. Take a care with you, her mother said, nodding toward Mia's sister. Glancing at her younger sister, Nia did not say what she was thinking, that Akir, who was only five years old, was too small and walked too slowly. She needs to learn, her mother said. Nia nodded. She picked up the plastic container and took Akir by the hand. Home for just long enough to eat now would now make her second trip to the pond. To the pond and back, to the pond and back, nearly a full day of walking altogether. This was Nia's daily routine, seven months of the year. Daily. Every single day. Southern Sudan, 1985. Salva had held his breath as he scanned the faces, one by one. Then the air left his lungs and seemed to take all hope with it. Strangers. No one from his family. The old woman came up behind him and greeted the group. Where are you going? she asked. A few of the people exchanged uneasy glances. There was no reply. The woman put her hand on Salva's shoulder. This one is alone. Will you take him with you? Salva saw doubt on the people's faces. Several men at the front of the group began speaking to each other. He is a child. He will slow us down. Another mouth to feed is already hard enough to find food. He is too young to do any real work. He will be of no help to us. Salva hung his head. They would leave him behind again, just as the others had. Then a woman in the group reached out and touched the arm of one of the men. She said nothing, but looked first at the man and then at Salva. The man nodded and turned to the group. We will take him with us, he said. Salva looked up quickly. A few in the group were shaking their heads and grumbling. The man shrugged. He is Dinka, he said, and began walking again. The old woman gave Salva a bag of peanuts and a gourd for drinking water. He thanked her and said goodbye. Then he caught up with the group, determined not to lag behind, not to complain, not to be any trouble to anyone. He did not even ask where they were going, for fear that his questions would be unwelcome. He knew only that they were Dinka, and that they were trying to stay away from the war. He had to be content with that. The days became a never-ending walk. Salva's feet kept time with the thoughts in his head, the same words over and over. Where is my family? Where is my family? Every day he woke and walked with the group, rested at midday, and walked again until dark. They slept on the ground. The terrain changed from scrub to woodland. They walked among the stands of stunted trees. There was a little to eat, a few fruits here and there, always either unripe or warm rotten. <laughs> Salva's peanuts were gone by the end of the third day. After about a week, they were joined by more people, another group of Dinka, and several members of a tribe called Tchurkul. Men and women, boys and girls, old and young, walking, walking, walking to nowhere. Salva had never been so hungry. He stumbled along, somehow moving one foot ahead of the other, not noticing the ground he walked on, or the forest around him, or the light in the sky. Nothing was real except his hunger. It was a hollow in his stomach, but now a deep, buzzing pain in every part of him. Usually, he walked among the Dinka, but today, shuffling along in a daze, he found he had fallen a little behind. Walking next to him was a young man from Jerkol. Salva didn't know much about him, except that his name was Faksa. As they walked along, Faksa slowed down. Salva wondered sluggishly if they shouldn't try to keep up a bit better. Just then, Faksa stopped walking. Salva stopped, too. But he was too weak and too hungry to ask why they were standing still. Faksa cocked his head and furrowed his brows, listening. They stood motionless for several moments. Salva could hear the noises of the rest of the group ahead of them, a few faint voices, birds calling somewhere in the trees. He strained his ears. What was it? Jet planes? Bombs? Was the gunfire getting closer instead of farther away? Salva's fear began to grow until it was even stronger than his hunger then. Ah. Uh, a slow smile spread over Bux's face. There. You hear? Salva frowned and shook his head. Yes. There it is again. Come. Buxa began walking very quickly. Salva struggled to keep up. Twice, Buxa paused to listen, then kept going even faster. What? Salva started to ask. Buxa stopped abruptly in front of a very large tree. Yes, he said. Now go call the others. By now, Salva had caught the feeling of excitement. But what shall I tell them? The bird. The one I was listening to. 
He led me right here. Looks so small, it's even bigger now. You see that? He pointed at the branches of the tree. Beehive, a fine, large one. Salva hurried off to call the rest of the group. He had heard of this, that the Jokol could follow the call of a bird called the Honey Guide, but he had never seen it done before. Honey, this night they would feast. Chapter 5, Southern Sudan, 2008. There was a big lake three days' walk from Nia's village. Every year, when the rain stopped and the pond near the village dried up, Nia's family moved from her home to a camp near the big lake. Nia's family did not live by the lake all year round because of the fighting. Her tribe, the Nuer, often fought with the rival Dinka tribe over the land surrounding the lake. Men and boys were hurt and even killed when the two groups clashed. So Nia and the rest of her village lived at the lake only during the five months of the dry season when both tribes were so busy struggling for survival that the fighting occurred far less often. Like the pond back home, the lake was dried up, but because it was much bigger than the pond, the clay of the lake bed still held water. Nia's job at the lake camp was the same as at home to fetch water. With her hands, she would dig a hole in the damp clay of the lake bed. She kept digging, scooping out handfuls of clay until the hole was so deep as her arms was long. The clay got wetter as she dug until at last water began to seep into the bottom of the hole. The water that filled the hole was filthy, more mud than liquid. It seeped in so slowly that it took a long time to collect even a few gourdfuls. Neil would crouch by the hole, waiting, waiting for water, here for hours at a time, and every day for five long months until the rains came and she and her family could return home.